Read verse 22. I'll get into an introduction and we'll get into our study. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. Now, in some ways, I would just like to read that and say, isn't that cool, and move on. But, of course, I'm not going to do that. Um, what we're going to be doing is actually pretty difficult for me. Would you turn to Genesis chapter 37, and I'll explain to you why it's difficult as you turn there. Genesis chapter 37. And the reason is, is because when our church first began to have Sunday night services back in 1982 or so, I did a, a study in the book of Genesis. And when I was doing the study in Genesis, I was very bold and I thought, well, I'm going to do something similar to what my pastor Chuck does. Pastor at that time was doing 10 chapters at a time. And I thought, well, let's try five. And so uh, I tried that for a while and discovered fairly early that I don't have that style. I'm not capable of condensing large portions of Scripture into some very few, very few words with great meaning. I take a lot of time to look at what I'm looking at. And so um, that's how our ministry developed to where it is so that today when you came to church this morning, you saw me teach four verses. Uh, that's how that came about. I realized that for me, I don't have the ability to, to give large chunks of information, and yet that's what I'm going to try to do tonight. I'm going to ask for your patience and prayerful help in this. Uh, help meaning um, I'll wake you up when you, you know, after you fall asleep before the service is over. But I have to tell you, I'm going to summarize chapters from chapter uh, 37 to chapter 50. And for me, that's kind of like, you know, parting the Red Sea, to be honest with you. It's one of those things I, I pray that I can do. And so what I'll be doing in some chapters is we'll look at the chapter. Like, for example, we'll look at most of chapter 37. But in other chapters, I'm going to tell you this is this chapter. These are the events that took place there and basically give an overview summary. So some places I'll say, let's read this together, and then I'll give you some insights. Other places, I'll say, well, this is chapter 40. It says this here, and this is basically what you find there. Because when I originally did this, uh, this study, um, I have to tell you, it took me a long time to get through all of these chapters. So I'm going to really try hard uh, tonight to get through these chapters in, you know, and get you out in time to go to work in the morning. So in Genesis chapter 37, I'll read to you uh, the first four verses, and let's get into our study concerning Joseph when he was dying, making mention of the departure of the children of Israel. Beginning at verse 1, Genesis 37. Now, Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the genealogy of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Billah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. So as we begin, Joseph is a tremendous man of God. There are those who would say that he is what would be considered a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when you do an in-depth study of the life of Joseph, you discover several things about him. Let me give you some of those things. One, uh, Joseph made superior claims. Two, Joseph was rejected by his brothers. Three, he was hated without a cause. Four, he was a victim of a conspiracy. Five, he was betrayed and sold. And six, he was later exalted. These are all types of Christ. And so he's used very often theologically in the Christian faith as a, as a type of Jesus Christ because he went through so many things. And so as we look at him, we see this man introduced to us first as a 17-year-old boy. And the Bible tells us here, as we were just looking in this passage, that his father Jacob had given him a place of authority in the family. Now what's interesting is you see verses 3 and 4, how it's very open, and it says Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his children, 
because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that, their father loved him more than all his brothers. They hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. And so what he has is he has a relationship with his father, his father loving him very much because he's the son of his father's old age. He was 11th born um, to, uh, to his father, and, uh, and his father, Israel, loved him more than he loved the other 10 sons who were born before him. And so that seems to be a trait because when you look in the family, you see that Abraham had, uh, had actually two sons. He had Isaac and Ishmael, but he liked Isaac, loved Isaac more. Then you see that Isaac had sons. He had Esau and Jacob, but Isaac loved Esau more than he loved Jacob. And now you see Jacob, who has his own sons, but he has a special love for one of those sons that is very obvious, and that is the son Joseph. Now later on, he's going to have another son by the name of Benjamin, who is also going to be one of his, uh, his sons that he loves with all of his heart. But he's showing here that he has a favoritism because he gives him a coat of many colors. Now, when it says he gave to him a coat with many colors, uh, the many colors speaks of various colored cloths. And in reality, the word color refers to the length of the sleeves. He gave to him a long-sleeved tunic, and a long-sleeved tunic is a symbol of authority. And so the older brothers hate him because his father has given the younger brother authority over all of the older brothers, and so they cannot speak peaceably to him. The brothers hate him. Now, he has older brothers, and we've seen these brothers as we've read through the names of his brothers. He has older brothers by the name of Reuben and Simeon, Levi and Judah. These are already mature men, and more than likely had been working away from him much of the time. So he grew up with uh, other sons, sons of Bila and son of Naphtali, uh, rather Rachel, and uh, Rachel's maid, and Zilpah, who was Leah's maid. And they were closer to his age. And so he spent a lot of time with these other brothers. Now, the older brothers have already disappointed Jacob because his three older brothers, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi especially, have done things that were greatly evil. Um, and I was, I was toying with the idea, should I condense these things for you and share what they had done? And, and I will very briefly. Um, <coughs> excuse me. In chapter 34, there's an interesting chapter. You don't have to look there. Let me summarize it. Let me try to do that. Um, it's really interesting because what happens is they have a sister, and the sister's name is Dinah. Dinah became close to some of the people in the area that they were staying in. And as a result of that, because she was hanging around with some of these pagan gals, uh, a prince of the area by the name of Shechem had seen Dinah and had grown very affectionate towards her, and he ultimately forced Dinah into a physical relationship with him. It's been called the rape of Dinah because he forced her to sexually have intercourse with him. And when her older brothers heard how they had taken and dishonored their younger sister, the older brothers were absolutely incredibly angry. And as a result of that, Simeon and Levi, older brothers of Dinah, wanted to take vengeance on what had taken place. And so the prince who had taken advantage of their sister, his name was Shechem, the prince said, listen, I love Dinah. I want to marry her. And so they created a plan in, in order for them to deal with Shechem and his father Hamor. And what they did is they said, well, we cannot give our sister or any of the women of Israel, any of our, our family, uh, to you because you are uncircumcised. Now, if you want to marry my sister, all the men are going to need to receive circumcision, all the men of your, of, your, of your city. And so Shechem, the Scripture says, was more honorable, and he wanted to do anything he could in order to have Dinah as his wife. And so they all underwent circumcision. Now, while they were yet healing from the operation, Simeon came in with his brother Levi and killed all the men in the city. And as a result of that, the father said, you have now made my name odious amongst these people, and they're going to seek to kill me. So he was already upset with his older brothers. Now, I believe it was Reuben had a relationship with one of the concubines, Bilhah, and he had sexual intercourse with her. So three of the older brothers were already uh, disappointments to the father. And now Joseph is bringing a bad report about the other sons to him. 
Now that must have irritated them greatly to have a 17-year-old showing up and, and telling daddy on, on the brothers and all. And they're very upset about what's taking place there. And so as a result of that, um, Jacob, uh, the, the hatred towards a Joseph is now stirred up. And so as this is taking place, verse 5, it says, Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I've dreamed. And there were... Uh, there we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? And he hated him, he hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed still another dream, told it to his brothers and said, Look, I've dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So it was told to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Well, they understood this picture, the picture of the mother and the father and the brothers all doing honor to him. The first dream was his brother's sheaves, that stalks of grain that are bound together, and they're all bowing before his sheaf. And the second, the sun, moon, and the eleven stars are all bowing before him. So they recognize what that means. But verse 11 tells us his brothers envied him. But his father pondered the meaning of this. The result of this is anger and hatred for Joseph because Joseph obviously is receiving some kinds of exaltation. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 27, 4, wrath is cruel and anger a torrent, but who is able to stand before jealousy? And that's what's taking place here. Now, ultimately, according to verses 12 through 14, his brothers travel about 50 miles to the north to the area of Samaria, and they're there feeding their father's flock. So Jacob sends Joseph to them to check on their condition. In verse 15, I'll begin reading, it says, Now a certain man found him, and there he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What are you seeking? He said, I'm seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, They have departed from here, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Now, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Then they said to one another, Look, this dreamer is coming. Come therefore, let us now kill and cast him into some pit. And we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit which is in the wilderness, and do not lay hand on him, a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So... It came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they, they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. Then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing spices, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judas said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come. And let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. Then Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. So this is a picture once again of the rejection. You see the type of Joseph and the similarities to the rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's a picture of the rejection. He's unable to find his brothers there. And he'd gone looking for them, and he ultimately encounters them. But now they're, in, they're conspiring to kill him. But notice, even as we saw a moment ago, his older brother Reuben didn't want him harmed, so he had him thrown into that pit wanting to deliver him. And so now he is sold. He is sold for 20 pieces of silver. Now, in verse 30, Actually, verse 29, it said, Reuben returned to the pit, and indeed Joseph was not in the pit. And he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The lad is no more, and I, where shall I go? So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, We have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? And he recognized it and said, 
It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Now notice verse 34. Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, I, I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. And thus his father wept for him. Can you imagine that for just a moment, how cruel that would be? How cruel it was for these brothers who hated him so much to take the one that they had such jealousy and envy over and to kill him. And when they brought that, even though they didn't do it, that was their intent, but they sell him into slavery. Then they take that, that cloak, that symbol, that tunic, that symbol of his authority, the symbol that was a gift from his father, they dip it in blood, and they bring it to the Father. You know, when I, when I first read this and was studying this, uh, and it, it, brings, it causes me to remember it even as I'm sharing you, with you now, it reminded me of something. You see, when my son David was a little boy, little David fell in love with the character Superman. My father, it turns out, had told him that he was Superman. Now, my dad had told me when I was a little boy that he was Superman. And the reason my father had told me that is because there used to be a show, a, um, a program on television in the 50s. It was Superman, and I would watch it every time it was on. And I actually admired Superman. I wanted, uh, you know, to be like him, you know, as a little boy. And uh, my dad got a little jealous because, after all, he's my dad. So my dad had told me that he was Superman, and I believed him. I believed that my father was Superman for years. I literally thought that my dad was Superman. It, it didn't make much sense to me when I would think about it, because Superman was from Krypton, and my dad was from Norwalk. Uh, Superman was tall. My dad was short. He was from Krypton. My dad's a Mexican. But I thought, well, you know, he must shave his mustache when he goes on his adventures. I, I, did, I really honestly believed for years that my dad was Superman, and my dad would just keep telling me that. And then finally, as I grew older, uh, I remember my dad saying that, uh, you know, he, he had a, a, a Superman costume. Because I asked him, I said, Dad, I said, how do you go about, uh, you know, doing all your business and all when... I'd, I've never seen your Superman costume. And he said, I have it in the garage, and I have it up in the rafters. That's where I keep it. This is the truth. I've told you this before. So my dad went to work, and I went into the garage, and I searched everywhere for the Superman uniform. I even went on top of the garage roof, and I went into the back of it where there was some ivy, and I looked under the ivy. I looked everywhere, and I waited. And when my father came home at 7 o'clock that evening, I was sitting there waiting for him. So when my dad walked in and came into the house, I couldn't wait to tell him, Dad, I know you're not Superman because I looked for your costume, and I couldn't find it. And I remember telling him that, Daddy, I looked for your costume and I couldn't find it. You're not Superman. And my father says to me, Son, my costume was in the cleaners. And I, I said, well, that made sense to me, you know. So I went on believing for years. Well, you know, of course, you outgrow that eventually. I was 35 and I realized he wasn't. But I didn't know that my dad had told little David, my son, that he's Superman. And so little David grew up believing the same lie that I did. But he was in love with Superman. Now his Aunt Patty was at, uh, you know, the Chino uh, flea market or whatever it's called. And she found a Superman cape. It had a little cape and it had a little yellow belt on it and a little S on his chest and he had the cape on his back. You see, he used to get a dishcloth and we would tie it around him and he would run around the house when he was two years old with his arms out, having adventures constantly. Patty had seen that. We told him, well, this is our super baby. We used to call him super baby. This is our super baby. And so Patty saw that and went and bought him a little cape. So little David would wear that cape everywhere. And for the, he would go to sleep with his cape on. We had to bathe him with his cape on. 
He wore it to church. He wore it everywhere. That little cape, we still have it. That little cape, he wears it to this day. He doesn't appreciate me telling you, but it's true. No, he had this. He's actually kept it for his own little guy. But this cape was a real important thing for my son. And, and when I read this, the first time I was teaching, my son was at the age where he was using that little cape all the time. And I still remember sharing with the church and saying to the church, it would be as if my son had been killed and someone brings to me his little cape with blood all over it and they say, do you recognize this? That's what the father is feeling when they bring this, this long-sleeved coat of many colors, this coat of authority, this cloak of authority. They're bringing it to him and they're saying, do you recognize this? Can you imagine the cruelty that is involved in doing something like that because daddy loved Joseph. And these brothers bring this and say, do you recognize this? Even though they know that they sold him into slavery. And this has to show you something about the heart of these men and the cruelty of his brothers. And it shows you the evil of envy the evil of jealousy, so that you would be willing to harm your own father simply because you hated him. Well, his heart is broken, and he says, I'm going to go down to my grave mourning my son. What happens is Joseph is sold. He is sold according to verse 36, chapter 37. The Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. And so he is sold into the hand of a man by the name of Potiphar. He's an officer. That word officer can also speak of one who is a eunuch. When it says he's the captain of the guard, that word guard is he's the captain of the executioners. Literally, he is the captain of the slaughterers. And so he is sold into the hands of the executioner. Now, he is now in the home of Potiphar. And while in the home of Potiphar, he is now being blessed tremendously. In, in chapter 39, uh, verse 1, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, uh, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph. And he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had put, all that he had, he put in his hand. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. And Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. So he's growing up, and he's a very, very handsome man. Now Potiphar has an absolute trust in Joseph. Joseph has full run of his home. He doesn't know anything other than, you know, he knows he's eating a meal today, but he trusts him so much that he trusts him with everything except for one thing. Joseph was trustworthy, but he had a wife. Potiphar had a wife who could not be trusted. Verse 7, it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, lie with me, big boy. But he refused. That's in the original. <laughs> but he refused and said, I shouldn't have said that, forgive me. And said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was inside that she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. 
But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. So it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, she called to the men of her house and spoke to them saying, See, he has brought in to us a Hebrew to mock us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And it happened when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. She kept his garment with her until his master came home. Spoke to him with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came in to mock me. So what happened as I lifted my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and fled outside. Now, one of the scriptures that we just read in verse 9 you ought to underscore, especially uh, those of you who may find yourself in positions sometimes of, of a temptation. Notice his answer. She first says to him, I want you to have physical relations with me. I want you to lie with me. But notice his response when he says in verse 9, How then can I do this great wickedness? Now notice, and sin against God. What is it that's going to keep you pure? What is it that keeps you pure? It's an appreciation of God's blessing in your life. It's what God has done in your life. How can I do this great sin against God? God has handed me so many things. God has entrusted me with so many things. You know, one of the things in ministry is a pastor can get to the point where he begins to feel that he's... Uh, a very attractive individual. You know, I, I've told pastors before, uh, don't get taken with yourself because uh, women are attracted in church very often to the power and position of a pastor. And just because they may show you some special attention, it doesn't mean that you are something special. It simply means that they're attracted to, to what they perceive you to be. And sometimes pastors begin to think that they are attractive and they can be seduced. But if the pastor were to have a heart to say, how can I do this evil? How can I sin against God in this way? It could keep them safe. Well, the same is true for all of us. In, in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 6, in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, the apostle Paul says this. He says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Flee fornication. You know, Joseph literally fled. He took off running, and she's grabbing at him. I mean, this is a woman who's not taking no for an answer. And he's, he's out the door. And as he moves out the door, she reaches towards him, grabs hold of his, his garment, and it stays in her hand. That is a literal, literal picture of fleeing fornication. And he takes off and he runs. Well, Potiphar reacts to what takes place. Verse 19, it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused. The question has to be asked, and uh, this may be reading into Scripture, but who is he angry at the most? I suspect that he knew that his wife was not to be trusted. I suspect that. Um, I, I, I would suspect that he knew the kind of man that Joseph was, and so his anger is aroused. And I wonder if my, part of his anger may be towards his wife. And I think also he has to do something to save face. And so verse 20, it says, Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph, showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's hand because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. And so once again, even in prison, first he's been sold into slavery, God prospers him. Now he's being put into prison. Once again, he's being placed into a position of authority because of the integrity and the hand of God upon him. And now he's an overseer taking care of certain things within the prison. Now, while he's in prison, and you see this in chapter 40, the Pharaoh becomes angry with two individuals in his court. He's angry with his butler who has oversight of the wine and he's angry at his baker. 
And so it says in verse 1, it came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended the Lord, the king of Egypt. And, and Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker. So he put him in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, so they were in custody for a while. Now it says in verse 5, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt who were confined in prison dreamed a dream, both of them, each man's dream in one, in one night and each man's dream with its own interpretation. Joseph came into them in the morning, looked at them, saw they were sad. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the custody of his Lord's house saying, well, why do you look so sad today? They said, we each have dreamed a dream and there's no interpreter of it. Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. Well, the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, Behold, in my dream a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches. It was as though it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Joseph said to him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Now, within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner when you were his butler. But, notice verse 14, but remember me when it is well with you. Please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews. And also I have done nothing here that should put me into prison, into dungeon. Well, when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, I also was in my dream, and there I had three white baskets on my head. In the uppermost basket, there were all kind of baked goods for Pharaoh, and the birds ate them out of the basket on my head. Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation of it. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh from you. Isn't that a nice dream? Well, it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief butler to his butlership again, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And so... All he had asked was, remember me when it is well with you. But obviously, when things go well with us, we forget how those things went so well, and he forgot about them. And so, according to chapter 41, two years later, Pharaoh has two dreams. Now, Pharaoh has dreams of seven starving cows. And these seven starving cows eat seven healthy cows. And then he has a dream where seven healthy heads of grain are eaten by seven thin heads. When he's so disturbed about this dream, he mentions it in front of the butler. And at that point, the butler now remembers Joseph. And Joseph is brought in to Pharaoh so that he might interpret the dreams. So Joseph begins to interpret, and he says, well, those, those cows and the heads of grain simply represent seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And so he gives to him counsel, and he says to him, collect one-fifth of the harvest for seven years and appoint an overseer to distribute because at the end of seven years of plenty, you'll have an overseer who can distribute the grain to your people who are going to be entering into a famine condition that is going to last for seven years. And so you can sell grain back to your people, and in doing so, you can become enriched. The result of that is that Pharaoh places him second in command in the nation of Egypt. Now, Joseph, remember with me, was taken and sold at the age of 17. He is now 30 years of age. Thirteen years have transpired in his life as he's been mistreated from one place after another. While he is there, according to verse uh, 50, Joseph is, gets married. He gets married to a woman named Asenath, who is the daughter of Potipharah, who is a priest of On. And she bore to him two sons. One's name, according to 50, verse 51, is Manasseh. Verse 52, the second son is Ephraim. 
And so he now is married, and he now begins to have his children. Now, according to chapter 42, the famine is now spreading, and it spreads all the way to where uh, Joseph's family lived. And so Jacob, his father, needs grain, and he tells his sons, his ten sons, to purchase grain in Egypt. Now, he has a son that was born to his beloved wife, who was born as she was dying, and his name is Benjamin. He keeps Benjamin with him because he's afraid that calamity may befall him. And so Joseph's brothers come and they stand before him. In chapter 42, it says, uh, beginning at verse 6, Joseph was governor over the land, and it was he who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them. But he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Then he said to them, Where do you come from? And they said, From the land of Canaan, to buy food. So Joseph recognized his brothers, but they didn't recognize him. Then Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them and said to them, You're spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, No, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all one man's sons. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. But he said, No, you have come to see the nakedness of the land. They said, Your servants are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And in fact, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no more. But Joseph said to them, It is as I spoke to you, saying, You are spies. In this manner you shall be tested by the life of Pharaoh. You shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother, and you shall be kept in prison, that your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison for three days. Joseph said to them the third day, Do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house. But you, go and carry grain for, for the famine of your houses, and bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified, and you shall not die. And they did so. Then they said to one another, We are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear. Therefore this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not speak to you, saying, Do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen? Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. But they didn't know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. And he turned himself away from them and wept. And he returned to them again and talked with them. And he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. So, wake up. So, um... <laughs> He looks like an Egyptian. He's dressed like one, made up like one. These Jewish shepherds show up. This is a man of high responsibility in the Egyptian court. They have no clue who he is. They haven't seen him since he's 17. 13 years have passed. He's a father. He's married. That'll do something to your looks. And that's what has happened. So they're speaking amongst themselves, as we just read. They're speaking in Hebrew not aware that he's listening to everything they say. Now, I used to play a lot of softball, and, um, and sometimes we would play teams uh, where they had guys who spoke Spanish, and I would be on base, and the, the coach, the third base coach, would be uh, actually, uh, yeah, I'd be playing third, and uh, the coach, and third, I remember this taking place, the coach for the other team was speaking in Spanish to one of the players there. And I don't speak fluent Spanish, but I understand enough of it. And so, you know, because I don't appear like, like I would, they were speaking Spanish around me, and I could listen to what they were saying. I could figure out what they were going to do. They're telling the guy to steal, or they're telling, you know, and I'm just kind of smiling there, you know. Well, anyway, that's what Joseph was doing. Joseph is there quietly, and they don't know that he can understand the language that is being spoken. And so they begin to speak amongst themselves. But it is so, can you imagine? It is so emotionally tearing to his heart that eventually what he has to do, notice verse 24, he turns away from them and he weeps. And he returns to them again and talks with them. It is so emotional as he is there watching all of this take place. Now, 
why did he ask for Simeon to remain? Notice verse 24, he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. The reason that he asks for Simeon is because the rabbis taught that Simeon was the one responsible for Joseph's slavery. And so he took the one that was responsible and he puts him in jail. Well, in verse 25, before they left, Joseph had their money restored to them and they placed it in their sack. On their journey home, they find it and now they're afraid. They return to their father Jacob, but he would not hear of letting Benjamin return. And they're telling him, listen, he says, we, 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 if we come back again, we've got to bring Benjamin. He says, absolutely not. That's not going to take place. To summarize chapter 43, the, sa the famine is severe, and now they have to return to Egypt to get grain. This time, they have to bring Benjamin with them, and they return. Now, Joseph had them come into his house, and he gives them a supper, and he returns Simeon to them. Now, upon seeing his brother Benjamin, once again, his emotion is too great and he goes and he weeps alone. But now in chapter 44, he sets a trap. In chapter 44, he hid a cup in the luggage of Benjamin when they left with the grain. And then he sends his men to pursue them, and they find this cup that he had hidden in their luggage. And they return the brothers to Joseph. This time, Joseph insists that his little brother remain there with him. Now notice what takes place in verse 30 to 34. It says, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us that he'll die. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Now therefore, please, let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me, lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father? So Judah begins to beg for mercy. He's saying, Benjamin is the youngest. He's dear to my father. Please let me be the one who's exchanged for him. Well, in chapter 45, Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers couldn't answer him. They were dismayed in his presence. Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not, therefore, be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. And verse 5, powerful. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land. And there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hasten, go to my father. Say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen. You shall, not, you shall be near to me, you and your children, your children's children, your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty. There are still five years of famine. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. In other words, I'm not using an interpreter. So you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you have seen. And you shall hasten and bring my father down here. And then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and broke it. No, he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Can you see the grace of God in this man's life? Listen, when things are done to us in our life that are harmful, that we see as being painful, we can learn a lesson from Joseph. Because Joseph points out, it wasn't you. It wasn't you alone, but God actually orchestrated the various events that led to my being where I am right now. 
So he had a picture of the, uh, in the long run what God could do. He, he saw that, yeah, the 13 years in, in house arrest and in prison, 13 years of the things that he went through were enough by themselves to cause anybody to become bitter, falsely sold, falsely imprisoned, falsely accused, so many things that were so wrong, and yet he had God's view of the thing, and he said, listen, God is in control of all of these things. We're going to see something in a moment, but that's something that he's teaching, and it's something that we need to learn, that the Lord is in control of everything that we go through. And so he knew, he knew that he had been sent ahead to save their lives at the expense of his own. Ultimately, according to verses 27 and 28, his brothers go home, and as they go home, they have to confess. It says, when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived, and Israel said, it's enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. So he's moved. He's so moved that he goes to Beersheba where his father had built an altar. Chapter 46, Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. Then God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. He said, here I am. And he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt. I will also surely bring you up again, and Joseph will put his hand on your eyes, meaning that he'll be the one who sends you off into eternity. And Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob, their little ones, and their wives in the carts which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. And so God meets him in a vision and sets his mind at ease, and he leaves. And as they begin to go, and as they're moving on, the father and the son finally reunite. Look at verse 28. He sent Judah before him to Joseph to point out before him the way to Goshen, and they came to the land of Goshen. So Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel, and he presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. And Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen your face, because you are still alive. Now, what an amazing reunion that would have been. What a blessing that would have been. This father who had, his, it had, had pretty much buried him in his own heart, no hope to ever see his son again, finally has an opportunity to be with this one whom he loved so very much. And Joseph, who loved his father with all of his heart, finally has this wonderful reunion with his dad. And as this is taking place, you can imagine the incredible emotion that is taking place between a father and a son who had been separated for so very long. And ultimately what happens is he takes him home to live with him and he remains with him. And finally, chapter 50. Verse 1, Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. This is when he died. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for him, for such are the days required for those who are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him seventy days. And when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, if now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the hearing of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Behold, I'm dying in my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. There you shall bury me. Now, therefore, please let me go up and bury my father, and I will come back. Pharaoh said, Go up and bury your father, as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the house of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's house. Only their little ones, their flocks, and their herds they left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great gathering. Then they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, and they mourned there with great and very solemn lamentation. He observed seven days of mourning for his father. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Atad, they said, This is a grievous mourning of the Egyptians. And therefore the name was called Abel Mizraim, 
which is beyond the Jordan. So his sons did for him just as he had commanded them. His sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, which Abraham bought with a field from Ephron the Hittite as property for a burial place. And after he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers, and all who went with him to bury his father. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? Verse 20, But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about that, about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation. The children of Mahir, the son of Manasseh, were also brought up on Joseph's knees. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. And Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. If you underscore scripture, verse 20, it's powerful scripture. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. One last thing, and then we'll close. There are times that things may occur that as they happen, you may think, what could be worse than this? This obviously is from the enemy and it's destroying me. But even when that thing occurs that is so painful and hurtful, God can use those things to build in you a sense of his presence and to awaken in you something that he intends for your life that is actually going to be good. When I was four years old, I, my brother and I were playing in my parents' home in the front room. My mom was in the kitchen with my sister Madeline. This was a day when we had a pocket door. This was a day when a lot of mamas would actually bathe their children in the sink instead of a bathtub. My sister uh, Madeline at that time was around a year, a little bit less than a year old, as I recall. And what mom would do is to save the, uh, the price or the cost of heating a whole house with the heater is she would just close the doors in the kitchen and turn on the oven and let the oven warm up that area. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Some still do that to this day. You can warm up the house with an oven. And my mom used to do that. It saved heating costs and all. And, and so she did that as a regular practice and she would bathe my, my sister in, in the kitchen. Well, my brother and I were playing in the front room and the pocket door was slid closed when we heard a sound of heavy falling and the pocket door begins to vibrate. And so when we heard the sound of someone falling, naturally we're afraid that perhaps my mom has hurt herself. And Frankie's six and I'm four. And so I remember going up to the pocket door and sticking my fingers in it and sliding it open and my mother's body falling into the, the area that I was in. Her body fell right at my feet. 
And as she fell there, she was between me and my sister. I couldn't get to my sister who was sitting there on the sink, wet from being bathed. And I couldn't get past my mom because I was afraid. You see, my mom was having an epileptic seizure. And for a four-year-old who has never seen anything like that, it's a terrifying experience. It's a very frightening experience. And so I remember pressing my back against the wall like this at my mom's head, my mom's head's at my feet, her head is at my feet, and she's having a seizure, and I am petrified. Now, my brother's only six years old, and he runs out of the house, and he says, w you, you watch, watch Madeline. And, and, and I remember leaning against the wall, and I remember my first prayer that I can remember praying. It was a simple one, God, don't let my mother die. I remember that prayer, God, don't let my mother die. My brother ran across the street and got a neighbor who came and found my mom on the floor at my feet and began to minister to her, took the baby. All of this felt like it took forever, but probably was less than five minutes. And from that day, at the age of four, I began to be afraid that my mother was going to die. I would go to school and occasionally get a phone call, your mother's been taken to the doctor, your mother's been in, is in the hospital. And for a series of all of my life up to 15, I can remember having a constant fear that one day I'll get a call and my mother's dead. I had a fear as a child. See, you hear my testimony of when I was 15, I started doing the drugs and the alcohol, but you don't know why. I tried to be good because I had this belief that if I was good, my mother would get well. And so I made a bargain with God that I would be good. And I tried hard until I was 15. I really did. I tried so hard to be the perfect son so that my mom would not grow ill. At the age of 15, I came to realize no matter what I'm doing, my mom's ill. And that's when I started drinking, and that's when I started partying, because I had convinced myself, you have given up all of these years, all of these years, 11 years out of 15, to trying to be good, and look at all that you've missed. And I still remember making decisions, and that's when I started drinking, that's when I started doing the drugs, and that's when I went in that direction. God saved me at the age of 20. But you know what happened? In all of that rebellion and all of that that I went through, I came to understand something about verse 20, and that's why I'm illustrating it this way. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. One of the things that the Lord has brought into my heart that is real, that is real, is I have a very tender heart towards people who are ill. Very tender. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, when I minister to people who are hurting, I understand that. I understand that because I've been there and I know the feeling. And that's why when somebody is hurting, that's why I sincerely care because I've been in that situation. And I believe that the Lord took what the enemy would have used for evil because he had, I, I, I had made the rebellious choice you know, who cares? Who wants to care? Who cares about these hurting people? I'm t but you know what the Lord did? The Lord said, no. No, I'm going to take what could have been used as evil, and I'm going to put something that's very deep in your heart, and that's to care for people. You guys don't know that. doesn't really matter in some ways, but I'm one of those guys who cannot watch these shows with children who are hurting. I can't watch them. I will not watch them. Marie knows this about me. The minute you see a little African child starving, I change the channel. I can't handle that because it hits me that deeply. And I'll turn to her and I'll say, we got to do something. We got to help somebody. There's got to be something we can do to help these kids. There's got to be something we can do to help that person. What the enemy intended for evil, God in my life has used it for good because it broke me and it made me tender. Now look at some of the things in your life that have happened that you might feel 
How could anything like this turn out for good? There are things that have happened that the Lord can use to develop a, a sense that other people just don't have. You, you may be like me. You know, sometimes people will tell me, man, you know, I, I was so loaded and I was so drunk, I don't even know how I showed up where I'm at. And, and, and I don't judge them. I don't sit there saying, hmm, how can you do that? Because I've been there. Because I know what it's like to wake up in a backyard and not know how you got there. How did I get here? I know what it's like to wake up in the backseat of a car filled with vomit that you have vomited all over yourself all night long because you were so drunk and so sick. I know what that's like. I know those feelings. And, and those things that the enemy wants to use for evil are the things that God uses in your life to develop compassion and understanding and forgiveness and love and appreciation and joy because God broke you. See, Joseph said, listen, I was sold into slavery. This is true. But I'm not blaming you for it because God used that. And though you intended it for evil, indeed you did, God used it for good. And that is how character sometimes is developed in our lives. So rather than hating the experiences we went through, we learn from those experiences and we look for God in those experiences. Perhaps the Lord is training me up in something here. Now, I do remember speaking to my own pastor, Chuck Smith, on one occasion saying, look at some of these lessons. Can't I just learn them from reading a book? And he said, well, no. These lessons you learn so that you can have compassion on other people because God is the God of consolation who gives to you consolation and so the consolation you have received you give to somebody else and that's how it works guys and so in many ways we can see things in our life that as we look back we say how in the world could those things work out for good and then God puts you in a position where you're ministering to somebody talking to somebody on the job site at school wherever and they're saying and I've never told anybody anything like this but this is what went on in my life and you're looking at them and you don't have to tell them I know exactly what you're talking about you don't have to do that but you do understand just today I was t talking to somebody after one of the services and they were sharing their heart with me and I just looking at them in the eye and I smiled at them and I said I know exactly what you're talking about I know exactly what you're talking about been there experienced that and I can tell you that God will bring you through I can tell you, God will bring you through because the Lord is able to do that. All of this in the life of Joseph so that he can ultimately make mention of the departure of the children of Israel and say, this is where I want my bones to be placed because he knew that God wasn't through with his life and God was going to do a work in that land even though he didn't die in the promised land but he made sure that he arrived there physically because God's promises are true. And so Joseph learned. And so may I encourage you today, may I encourage you that even though you may go through some things that are unfair and painful, to look for what God can do in them and you will be amazed at what the Lord will use even when the enemy meant it for evil.